have drawn the sacred storytelling circle because storytelling art creates revelations of enlightening mm -hmm. delight. And today we are here to celebrate Telebration, an annual celebration of storytelling that's been going on since the 1990s. All around the world today, in the United States, Canada, Australia, <coughs> New Zealand, Thailand, other places where people gather to tell stories, they're gathering, telling, and listening to stories. And this is our third celebration. And we're really happy and grateful for you to be here. And tonight, we have five tellers. I'm going to introduce them first. This is Carol D., who has, is a native Alaskan, but spent a long time in Italy. And many of you may have known her because she works at hospice. This is Kate Faraday, a retired school teacher who spent a lot of time doing her teaching in Girdwood and Anchorage, but she's having fun living in Homer. Mm -hmm. And she is a natural storyteller. We have Troy Wise, who joined us last year. He was in the audience, just like you, and he came up and told a story, and he's been with us every month since. And he is a Vietnam vet, and he has some really interesting stories. And we've got Carol Ford, who is a storyteller, author, actress, director, and professional grandmother. <laughs> and I'm Skywalker Payne, and I'm a storyteller, author, and online entrepreneur. So <laughs> I'm really happy to have you here. We are going, this is, storytelling is the theater of the mind. So. We want to save any applause until the end of the whole program. That way we can be more like a real storytelling circle where the storytellers will come up when they're given the storytelling stick and they'll tell the story and then the next teller will come up. Enjoy. And we're going to begin with Mr. Thank you. Um, first, I'd like to say that all my stories are true, but they're n almost never told the same way twice. I can't remember that well. Uh, so there may be in inaccuracies, there may be uh, a different version. You never know until it's done. So uh, this is a story about Vietnam. It's a, uh, you know the difference between a war story and a fairy tale, right? <laughs> fairy tale begins with once upon a time, and a war story usually begins with something like, this is no <laughs> But this story is true. Uh, I was drafted in August of 1966. And the reason I mention that is to point out and have you keep in fact in mind that my service wasn't voluntary. Somehow it managed to be four plus years. And I must have signed something in there somewhere that let it go beyond my original two commitment. But I served two tours, two and a half tours in Nam. Uh, this story is about my second tour. And uh, as I in my second tour, we will uh, be talking about Christmas of 1969. As I uh, was in country, I realized on that second tour that I had a unique position, that I had knowledge that not every helicopter pilot had. Um, my first tour being a grunt, the uh, cannon fodder, tip of the spear type thing. Uh, I knew what we liked to get from home in those care packages. And I knew what we didn't like. Because uh, you saw the guys getting a lot of stuff that was pretty useless by the time I got to you. But chocolate, not so much. Um, 
canned cheese, fresh cheese, any cheese, any hot sauce, anything that would make sea rations edible. And we got to be pretty good cooks with all this extraneous stuff we got sent from home and made our meals edible. Uh, and I was in a position to maybe accumulate the items that the grunts really wanted and get it to them and why not pick Christmas Day and we'll just make a party out of this. So I talked to my parents and uh, my parents were amazing support for my brother and I. Uh, their only two sons were both in Vietnam flying at the same time, yet they were very, very, very supportive. Never a, a discouraging word. I asked them if uh, they might be interested in telling all their friends to start sending me these goodies. And uh, the one goodie that you may not think of right off the bat is canned pop popcorn. Uh, my mom had discovered a company that sold five gallon cans of pop popcorn in different flavors. And it was really a unique thing back in 69. So, and we loved it. Uh, I, every time we got some of that went real fast. So I asked her if she would uh, start sending that stuff to us and then I kind of went out on a limb and guaranteed I would get everything they sent to us out to the grunts in the field on Christmas Day. So uh, she went back and organized her sorority sisters. My dad militarized the Calabasas Chamber of Commerce. He had been a past president, so he uh, called in all his chits. And this stuff started arriving. And storage and logistics became our biggest concern. I went and talked to my uh, commanding officer. We were a, uh, what we call lift company in the 1st Cavalry Division. We had like about 18 helicopters, uh, Huey Slicks. There were three of us companies and then one company of gunships. So we had plenty of aircraft and uh, my CO loved the idea. He said, you can have two Hueys with crews and do what you will with them. Well, selling them on the black market and getting out of town was a really good idea at first, but we, we passed on that one. Um, I then went to the commanding officer of the battalion of uh, grunts that we serviced every day, that we supported. We were their lifeline. We took them in the battle, back out of battle, brought them resupply, brought them food, brought them ammunition, took their wounded. We were their link with the world. And a uh, battalion commander uh, was very gung-ho individual and he was surprisingly supportive. He said, I will pull all the battalion, that's three companies of grunts, into the LZ, my headquarters LZ. A note aside of that, if you're not familiar with the term LZ, we all thought we were speaking code when we used the phonetic alphabet for letters for things instead of actually saying landing zone. <laughs> we would say Lima Charlie. We thought this was just being cool and secretive and no one would know what we're talking about right now. Well, at any rate, he would bring in his uh, three of his four companies, and then the fourth company would have to stay outside on security, making sure we didn't get bothered during the day. Um, sounded great. So it was easy to round up the crews. Uh, everybody wanted to go on this one. But we had two Hueys absolutely jam-packed full. And if you ever been up close to one, uh, they had pretty good cargo space when you take all them seats out and people. Uh, so we had a crew of four and we had two jam full Hueys. We, uh, Christmas Day came, we went out and uh, the whole plan hinged on whether the enemy would leave us alone for a day. So uh, the rest of it gets fairly anticlimactic, it all worked. Uh, we went to the battalion LZ, unloaded all our stuff, uh, and then took the regular log run out to the company in the field and added all the Christmas goodies we could for them that they would need. And we went out and spent the day with them and not a shot was fired that we know of. 
and uh, just turned out to be an all-around good day. Uh, everybody got to think about something else just for a little while, and uh, we all felt pretty good about it. Uh, the weather, the enemy, people back home, and the brass all all cooperated on the same day, and it was it was a great day. So. around and all stories are true and all of my stories are true but they're not my stories and this story comes to us last year I told a story from the Akamba people in Kenya this is from the Kamba people in Kenya and they say that once there was this man who was very 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 poor and he heard about a wealthy man called he who feeds the poor. So the very poor man walked out on this long journey looking for he who feeds the poor. And he finally found, finally found him in a mansion in the middle of this beautiful green field. And he had hundreds of sheep and cattle and people who worked for him. And the very poor man went before he who feeds the poor and told him his story. And he who feeds the poor listened to him with compassion and decided, well, this man does need some help. So he told his aides to give him a hundred cattle and a hundred sheep. And the poor man said, oh no, I don't want your charity. I want the secret to become wealthy. So he who feeds the poor had to think about that. And he left and came back with a little bottle that had a liquid in it. And he said to the very poor man, take this ointment and put it on the long top back teeth of your, wo your wife and wait for them to grow. So the very poor man took the ointment and he didn't know quite if this was going to work, but he trusted he who feeds the poor. And he went home and told his wife this and she wasn't too happy at all. So they went to the witch doctor and he smelled it and tasted it and said it would be safe for her to rub it on her teeth. And she did. And after a few weeks, her canine teeth in the back started to grow long. And they grew longer and longer until they came out of her mouth. And they were beautiful, smooth, and curved on the end. And when they got as long as her husband's arm, he said it was time to pull them. So once again, the wife wasn't too happy and they went to the witch doctor and he gave her some herbs to make her relax and not feel any pain and he took the teeth out. And her husband took them to the market and was able to buy a flock of goats. And they did start to become wealthy. He was able to sell goat meat, sell goat milk, sell the fur. Meanwhile, his wife, the teeth started to grow back again. And not only the teeth, but she started to get taller and bigger. And her skin was turning gray. And she was not feeling comfortable in the house. She didn't feel like she used to. She could feel the forest calling to her. So one day, when she had gotten very big, she just jumped up and ran out of the house into the forest, breaking the door as she left because she was that big. 
And in the forest, she was happy, eating grains and fruit and grasses. And she gave birth to a baby. And this baby was not human. He had four big legs and long tusks and floppy ears and a long nose. And the husband came and tried to get his wife to return, but she never did. She stayed in the forest and had more little elephant babies. And that is how elephants came to be. And that's why they are as intelligent as human beings. And I know that is true because when I went to the zoo in Phoenix, Arizona, I looked into the eyes of a mama elephant and she met my eyes. And she was intelligent and kind and we had a communication that I've remembered for all these years. Thank you.